A Blackguard Dog by Husketeer, part of the Inhuman Axe anthology available at furplanet.com. Contrary to legend, the black dog doesn't come looking for you. It's already there. Most people just don't see it until the right moment. But I'm not most people. I often wish I was. What do you reckon, Hunter? My partner gets down on all fours to examine the woman's body. Her own black dog is long gone. According to Hunter, his kind is never out of work for long. Someone's always getting born. I don't think this is about insurance fraud anymore. Thanks, Hunter. Thanks a million. Hunter can't say if assignments are random or tailored, if they're specific to the individual. I don't want to know why I got a portly black Labrador in a trench coat and dark glasses, whose greatest joy in life is pepper jerky. As I watch, he sucks in the end of his current stick, chews, and swallows. Sorry, John. You know I can't do much without another dog to talk to. I'll call the police. Bodies weren't part of the plan for today, and the water's gotten too deep and murky for a little fish like John Maza. Private detective is what I put on my tax forms, and enter online when I'm asked to fill out my occupation. It never shows up in the drop-down box for some reason, but the bulk of my work comes through this big property firm. I find out whether fires, missing deliveries, workplace injuries, and other assorted incidents and accidents are just people being people, or people being dishonest people. I am, when I'm being an honest person myself, a loss adjuster. The building I'm in is an old Victorian property, like all the houses on this street that didn't go in the Blitz. It's been split into flats, and the land it stands on, when the neighboring plot that's been sold already, would be worth more with new development on it. You can fit a lot more tenants in those purpose-built jobs. All that was standing in the way was the fact that the house was a listed building. Try to knock it down, and the entire community's up in arms. Unless it catches fire first. Convenient for everyone, except the owner. And apparently someone else. The body isn't burned, or even marked. Smoke inhalation, I tell myself. Just like a proper detective. We're way up on the attic floor, and nothing in this room caught fire, but the smell of smoke has drifted in, and a fine coating of ash has settled on the floor. Hunter sneezes and shakes his ears. It's an affectation. His paws leave no imprint in the ash, so he can't be breathing it in. He's just messing around because he doesn't know what to do. When I was a kid, I thought having Hunter would make me the best detective in the world. He could talk to other black dogs and give me the skinny, whatever that is, and I'd solve the case as if by magic. It works sometimes, and I've had a few successes, but it's hard when you can't explain how you got your evidence without bringing mythical beasts into it. Hunter has his moments, sure, but mostly he's a big, useless lump with meat breath. He couldn't even tell me my wife was having an affair. He's pretty good at I Spy, though. When the police arrive, the little attic gets crowded. There are two officers, one man and one woman, and that means two black dogs, too. Only Hunter and I can see them as they cram themselves in. One is an all-black Doberman, but the inspector's is a miniature Pomeranian. Hunter and I have often discussed whether your dog has a paw on what you'll be when you grow up. They tend to be short discussions, because he can't stand it when I use expressions like, has a paw in. Yo, the palm says to Hunter. That your human? Did he do it? No, he didn't. And he can see us, so shut your yap. She growls, but subsides. Hunter seems to have some kind of seniority over other black dogs. He's not sure but he thinks he's been around a long time, gone through a fair number of human lives. Maybe that's why he likes to walk on two legs, too, and wear clothes. Or maybe that's just his weird sense of humor. The constable takes my details along with a brief statement. I'm glad I haven't touched the body. Hunter always takes care of that side of things for me. No prince. The Doberman leans against his legs and looks up at him adoringly from glowing red eyes. I wince. What if those eyes met his? That's why Hunter wears shades. Something the matter, Mr. Maza. It comes out like a tongue twister, but he keeps a straight face. I shake my head. The black palm is sniffing around the attic, poking her head and paws into every nook and cranny. Some of them are like that, getting involved with their people's lives. Suddenly she stiffens, yaps so hard her tiny paws lift off the floor, and starts trying to stuff herself into a gap between two boxes. Her paws scrabble helplessly, unable to touch whatever it is she's seen, and her yaps take on a plaintive tone. I think there's something down there, I say, to put her out of her misery. I'm rewarded with a suspicious stare, but the constable pulls the boxes apart and tweezes her something, a crumpled piece of paper it looks like, into a plastic bag. I'm familiar enough with police work to know it's probably nothing. Rather than thank me, the little dog turns to Hunter. How come? she asks. Don't know. He was born that way. They hold eye contact for a few seconds. Hunter's jaws work away at a jerky stick. The palm's nose twitches. I've no idea what's passing between them, but at the end of it, she gives a little snuff and trots over to her inspector. Mr. Maza, 
Sorry, what did you say? I said, report to any police station within the next seven days with your documentation. And don't leave the country, please. I have no intention of going anywhere. I'm involved now. Although I could report to any police station, I'd look up the caller number of one of the officers and go to that one. While I give my statement, Hunter prowls off in search of the officers we met at the house, and their dogs. By the time I'm finished, he's back at my side, breathing hot, jerky breath down my neck. How he does that, when he has no other physical presence? Well, that's annoying, but it's usually the least of my worries. He falls into step beside me as we walk to the bus stop. Did you find the palm? Her name's Delphine. Ooh, I elbow him where his ribs would be if I could touch him. He's never shown this level of interest in a girl dog before. Do you want to know or not? Please. The dead woman was an employee of Hutch Estates. The developer trying to buy the land. This was almost like a real case, complete with the fact that I had absolutely no reason to get involved. Obviously, they're investigating the company, or obviously denying any involvement. Obviously, I grin at Hunter, who glares back. At least, his eyebrows lower over his glasses. I know that look, he says. Why not just do the job you're paid for? What's up, Hunter? I thought we both wanted to be proper detectives, to make a difference. Now that this thing's dropped in our laps, aren't you the least bit interested? Don't you want to make absolutely sure there hasn't been a murder right under our noses? He doesn't answer. He's sometimes sensitive about body part metaphors, given his incorporeality. Anyway, the police won't let me do the job I started now. The fire has already cost my employers, the company that owns the current flats, a hell of a lot. They've had to put the tenants up in a hotel, and they'll also be liable for destroyed and damaged possessions. Now they're faced with a choice between rebuild and replace, a big job that will leave them out of pocket even after the insurers cough up, or simply selling the land to Hutch. It all seems petty now a life's been lost. What was her name? I ask. He looks at me, knows I want to look into this properly. I know him, too, and I can tell he doesn't want me to. Hunter used to be as keen on playing detectives as I still am, and I wonder what's wrong. Eventually, he gives me a doggy sigh with a little squeak in it, raises his eyebrows above the glasses, and tells me, Phoebe Knight. I spend my evening tracking Hutch Estates through the news sites. It does something to keep the image of the body away. I'd always thought their name was a subtle joke, but it turns out there really is a Mr. Hutch at the helm. He smirks out of a photo on the About Us page of the company website from a private office with paintings on the walls and an ornate dagger on the coffee table. The slightly creepy side of the business, ready to help you find the home of your dreams. For a price. A high price for some people, it turns out. Go through the news archives for the last ten years and the name of Hutch Estates pops up a number of times in connection with deaths and accidents. Purely incidentally, of course. More than a decade ago, fewer newspapers were online. If I want to go any further down this alley, I'll have to wait till morning and get my lazy self to go to an actual library. Hunter is uncharacteristically quiet while all this is going on. He looks over my shoulder occasionally and paces the carpet, and munches jerky sticks. Eventually, he says, Don't you think you should leave this to the professionals? What's up? Squeamish about dead bodies? You'll be seeing mine sooner or later. We both know it, but rarely bring it up in conversation. His silence is hacking me off, though. Yeah. And I'd rather it was later. He scratches his ears fiercely. Could be centuries before I get another human I can actually talk to. Longer before I get one I'd want to. He doesn't know enough about himself or the rest of his kind to know how rare my so-called gift might be. He doesn't often reveal it to other dogs, the way he did with the palm. Sorry, with Delphine. You just want to stick with me so you can see more of Delphine. Shut up. Have you thought this thing through, though? I'm sure the officer's very nice, but I might run out of small talk on a double date. Black dogs can't stray far from their people. We found that out the first time my mom instructed me to leave my imaginary friend at home while I went to school. That's when I learned to lie, and Hunter learned just how much he could torment me if I'd get in trouble for reacting. Give it a rest, Hunter flashes yellow teeth. Put a jerky stick in it. Fine. He snaps one in two and crams both halves into his muzzle. Crumbs fall but vanish before they hit my carpet. He wanders off after that, and as much as he can. He's out of my eyeline, and quiet, so I can't tell if he's sleeping or thinking or what. It must be dull for him, being tethered to a sedentary bloke like me. Sometimes I turn the TV on for him. I carry on browsing, waiting to get sleepy. There isn't a peep out of Hunter while I browse, but suddenly I smell jerky, and when I turn around he's right there, nose almost on my neck. Could you not be creepy, please? He backs off and takes a chair. Presumably he hovers just above it. I've never been able to figure that out. But he looks convincing enough, straddling the seat with his arms on the backrest. His mouth is a grim line, and I'm suddenly frightened. 
John, don't be scared, but I'm going to take the shades off. But I feel fine. That's a lie. My chest hurts. My stomach's squeezing. My hands feel cold and damp. I'm dying. Heart attack? No. This has all come on since Hunter spoke. It's just harmless old fear. I think I'm going to die, so I'm freaking out. Hunter hasn't moved since his warning. What kind of sick joke is he pulling this time? Nothing happens. Hunter waits, silent and motionless, while my heart rate slows and my stomach settles down. Even his jaws, usually mumbling away at a jerky stick, are still. Only the fine whiskers on his muzzle flutter with his breath. Nothing is still happening. I let out my breath. I'm alive. I can't kill you just by looking at you, John, he says at last. That's not my power. It has to be the right time. What? You always let me think... I only started wearing the glasses because my eyes made you cry when you were little, and it came in useful to have you think I could kill you at any moment. Still does, sometimes. He at least has the decency to look ashamed at that. I remember you sitting next to my cot, I tell him. I was crying because I couldn't touch you. You were a cute baby. He whips the sunglasses off his nose. I squeeze my eyes shut and bury them in the crook of my elbow, then, embarrassed, peer over the top. His eyes. I've seen other black dogs, of course, with their eyes glowing among the dark fur like lit coals, but I've never let my gaze linger, just in case. Looking at Hunter now, I see I was wrong. Those aren't coals. They're holes. Tunnels straight to the pit of hell. My silly, funny, lifelong companion and friend has a direct eye line to the devil. They're like lasers. A light so intense the red burns back to black at the center and leaves a green splotch when I close my eyes. I'm scared that if I stare too long I'll go blind, but warm dog breath blows across my face, breathing. Open your eyes! Open them! John! I unsqueeze my eyelids a fraction, peering out between the lashes like I'm trying to cheat at hide-and-seek. Hunter's nose is up against mine, so close I can see the pores glinting with moisture and the little hooks of his whiskers. Is his muzzle going gray? Can that even happen? His paw sweeps upwards, and even though he can't touch me, my chin follows until I'm looking him square in the eyes. I get to my feet, back away slightly. He stands too, eyes locked on mine. We're exactly the same height. I never noticed. My attempts to distract myself from those eyes aren't working. I try to focus on them, but my brain can't quite figure out where the focal point is. It's like staring down twin tunnels. The red points, pupilless, seem to shift and waver around. I feel myself going hot and prickly, though the hairs on my arms are standing up on end. John... Hunter's voice seems to come from a long way off. The heat is flushing my face and making my heart race. John, I can't hurt you, and neither can my eyes. They're weird and scary, but they're not fatal. All right, trust me. And I do, because he's been the one constant in my life. A constant that nobody else can see, but if I stop believing, I'll know I'm mad. I stare until Hunter is just Hunter, his tummy bulgy under his trench coat, his tail poking stupidly out of the hole in the back. My best friend. My partner. Sure, he has two glowing holes in his face, but nobody's perfect. Hunter puts his shades back on. The room seems to grow lighter, and I realize I have a headache. I set about going to bed, pottering in and out of the bathroom while Hunter, who doesn't have a bedtime ritual, certainly not brushing his teeth, lounges against the wall and watches. When I get into bed, he shrugs off his coat and curls up on it, turning around to get comfortable. Why did you do that? I don't mean the turning around. He's been doing that ever since I can remember and he doesn't even pretend he thinks I do. His paw tilts the frame of the glasses forward a fraction, so I get a searing flash of red that makes me blink, then replaces them. Because if you're going to go through with this, and if this is what I think it is, you needed to see what I've just shown you, and know what I've just told you. Well, thanks, I guess. Good night, cryptic dog. Good night, silly human. I could get used to this proper detective stuff. Unfortunately, none of it is working. I never see Hutch arrive at the offices of his eponymous company, or leave them, despite long hours on stakeout. I'm no stranger to waiting. A lot of my work catching out benefits cheats involves lurking outside their houses, poised to photograph them in the act of something a person with a bad back couldn't manage. But after a week, it's dispiriting. Besides, nobody is paying me for this. It's amazing how the thought of an hourly rate can leaven up sitting in a car for hours. I drop in on the pretext of looking for a luxury Docklands penthouse, but I can only really do that once. Hunter tries snooping around while I do, but he can't get far enough in without me following. I get a little of my paying work done in the evenings, on the internet, but a lot of my time is taken up by trying to glean information about Hutch online. He has a business profile with links to a few contacts, but nothing personal. Nobody tags him in photos. He doesn't have a gym membership, and he doesn't seem to stay at hotels. 
Even his home address is a mystery. I can only work on the personal data the companies are legally able to sell, and he's been careful about giving that away. He must really, really hate getting junk mail. It's Hunter who gets me my interview with Delphine's inspector. We've gone through what I'm going to say. The big black idiot thinks he knows my job better than I do now, but none of it is having any effect until he takes the black palm aside and whispers to her. Whatever he's saying makes her quiver a bit, then she jumps up into her human's lap and snuggles in. The inspector can't see her black dog, or feel her, even when Delphine is licking her hand, but something must be getting through because her attitude shifts from unhelpful to, I'll think about it, to letting me accompany her to Hutch's office. After lunch. It's practically a date now. Hunter insisted it had to be the inspector, too. When any uniformed officer would have got me through the doors, he's gone all professional again. Lydia is never going to hear the end of this Delphine business. Lunch isn't a date. I've blagged my way into it with wild claims of being able to provide evidence against Hutch. I have no idea what this evidence might be, and I really hope Hunter has. And now Inspector Ruxley, her first name is Anne, just wants a chance to decide whether I'm genuine or a nutter. It's not easy to prove the former, when at least half my mind is on Hunter and Delphine. They're definitely flirting, and I don't know whether to be disturbed. Hunter walks on two legs and wears clothes, and it feels wrong that he's hitting on what is to all appearances a dog, a beat a talking invisible one, or amused. Just as long as you understand the risks, I hear him say. I have to cover a laugh at this outrageously old and corny trick. Oh baby, I'm so wild and dangerous. John? I begged you to drop the Mr. Maza stuff as soon as we left the police station. Sorry, what? I just asked why you were so interested in this case. Oh, just a hunch. Now I'm coming out with the corny lines, too, but Anne nods. I think more police work revolves around hunches than any of us want to admit. By the time lunch finishes, I don't want it to. I've been in a pleasant little bubble that definitely isn't any sort of double date, and as far as I'm concerned, the real world can get stuffed. But Hunter is already at the door, staring out at the rain. He's not wearing his shades anymore. Hasn't since the night we've practiced gazing into each other's eyes. Delphine skips after him and, as if attached to an invisible lead, Anne puts her credit card away and stands. Every time I've visited the Hutch estate, I've been sent away with a flea in my ear and my tail between my legs. Or so I told Hunter, to annoy him. Anne just walks in and shows her ID. We'd like to see Mr. Hutch, please. And, just like that, we're in. The receptionist talks urgently on the phone, too low for us to hear although Hunter pricks up his ears. Then we're being led through a door I didn't even notice on my reconnoitering trip, along a corridor and into the office from the About Us picture. All that fine detective work hitting the search engines, and what I should have done is visit the nearest adult shop for a police uniform. Hutch, like his office, is just the way he appears on the website photo. Graying hair, lined, aristocratic face, dark eyebrows. What the website didn't show, because it won't show up in photos, I tried often enough with Hunter, as a boy, is the black dog at his side. It's not any breed I recognize, though if I had to pick I'd probably go for Hellhound. And it's black, blacker than black. Hunter's coat has that well-fed Labrador gloss to it. This dog's fur is like shark skin, reflecting no light. I can barely make out the haunches and the massive paws. It looks like one block of shaggy, malevolent darkness. Seated, its head comes up to Hudge's chest. The head itself is as big as his, something like a wolf crossed with a mastiff, with brows eerily similar to Hutch's overhanging the... Don't look at the eyes. Hutch sees me looking. He knows what I'm looking at. I always wondered if there were others, he says, and his dog's tongue comes out, blacker than a chow chow's. I expect it to be forked like a snake's, but it's an ordinary dog tongue, poking over big yellow teeth, and a dribble of drool confirms it. Its tail thumps once. It's long and thin, like a greyhound's, and this is somehow the most disquieting thing of all. Others? Anne asks, making me jump. Ten minutes ago, we were sharing lunch and I was indulging in mild romantic fantasies. Now I'd forgotten she was there. Hutch, though, beats me in the discourtesy stakes by not even acknowledging the police officer's presence. Delphine is circling the bigger dog, unsure what to do. Hunter stands at my shoulder, but every hair on his body, at least those not hidden by his coat, is standing on end, and his tail is trying to tuck itself between his legs. I've never seen him like this before. I never imagined a situation where he couldn't take control. Wise, implacable, and protective. We have evidence that you were involved in the deaths. My voice is a croak. There is no evidence, and I don't know where I thought Hunter was going to pull it from. He lied to bring me here, so he could, what, turn me over to this man and his terrifying dog? It can't kill me. I remember that from Hunter's little pep talk. It can't kill me. It kills Anne.
That great head snakes around and the red eyes target her like lasers, so I can see their glow flicker across her face. She frowns, brushes the hair from her forehead, and turns in the direction of whatever she's sensing. I shout a warning, but her eyes widen and I know she's seen it. Hutch's dog shocked me, and I've been seeing the black dogs all my life. I can't imagine what it must be like for Anne in the brief time between the apparition and her hands going to her chest as she sinks to her knees and topples face forwards. Delphine shrieks as though every bone in her is being crushed and runs to her human, but before she can reach Anne, her body is dissolving like ash and whiffs away in black smoke. At least she'll come back, unlike her human. Now we can talk, Hutch says pleasantly. It's not him I want to talk to, it's Hunter. Hunter, who told me only your own black dog can open the door between life and death, and even that only at the right time. He lied again, but one look at him and I see he didn't know he was wrong. He's panting with distress, and the pale rims of his eyes are showing around the red. It's nice, isn't it? Having a lifelong companion, a secret nobody knows. Hutch's hand reaches down and he caresses the air above his dog. They can't touch each other any more than Hunter and I can, but it leans into the stroke and rumbles, ears submissive. I thought I'd use mine to make money. Well, you are a loss adjuster? You've visited my offices a couple times in the last week. I'm a private detective. How sweet, a boy and his dog. You're killing people over the property market? It's a very lucrative market. I don't kill people often. You have to be careful. Mostly I use Caron here to find information for me and to influence my business contracts. It's a little like being a private detective, I imagine. His grin tells me that he knows exactly how good I am at being a detective, and I wish I'd made a better stab at it. My standing is pitiful compared to his. Oh, at least I have the moral high ground by several thousand feet. You killed Anne. The autopsy will say she had a heart attack. And Phoebe Knight, your own employee. Sooner or later, someone is going to get too curious for their own good about my methods. You killed her and dumped her body in the flats before you started the fire. How are you planning to get away with that? Ah, smoke inhalation. I was pleased with that one. Karin's mouth opens, and black smoke dribbles down to drift along the floor. I can smell it, bitter and dangerous. A glance at Hunter tells me he's never seen anything like this. All they can do is make infinite jerky sticks appear. Now that I think of it, this is the longest I've seen him go without one. Tricky to eat when your jaw's hanging open. Hutch hasn't lasted this long by bumping someone off every other day. It's a classic pattern. Killer kills once, then again to cover their tracks, or because the first time was so easy. Eventually, they get so desperate or hardened that more killing seems the only way out. And they up the pace. Phoebe Knight, then Anne, all in a matter of days. And now, most certainly, me. There are rules. Hunter speaks for the first time, and I can tell it's an effort. I've never seen his ears so low. It speaks! What's your name, then? Why don't you guess? You know everything else about me. I don't want him to know Hunter's name. That just feels too intimate. Hunter must agree, because his jaw snaps shut. As for the rules, we've been breaking them all my life. The dog's ears perk at the wee. It looks pleased and reveals even more teeth. I started when I was a boy, by changing his name. Then the training began. You can't do that. Hunter's voice is flat, but I've known him long enough to recognize the note of panic behind it. It's the voice he used when I scared myself into almost drowning at the beach, and he had to talk me back up onto the sand. You need a strong will to disobey, and a stronger one not to pop out of existence once you have. He leans back and smirks, and the dog Caron tips its head up in an ecstasy of pride and love. I can teach you, if you like. Your dog's a little tubby, but he can train. Would you like that, boy? Like to influence the world around you with more than your mouth? You've got such a wonderful opportunity here, both of you. Stick with me and I'll show you. Here's where we pretend to go along with the scheme until we can get out of this and get Hutch arrested. Unfortunately, Hunter didn't get the memo. He's so used to nobody being able to hear him except me, he's gotten lippy. And now it'll be the death of both of us. That's not what I'm for, and it's not what he's for, he snarls. You, Caron, snap out of it and do your job, you pea brain. I wonder if, despite the dog's size and sinister appearance, it's actually as dim as Hunter is suggesting. It hasn't said a word, just smoldered and menaced, and I wouldn't let a slime ball like Hutch mold me into a tame executioner. I hope. Caron, kill them. The human first, so the dog can watch. I jerk my head away and stare fixedly at the ceiling. A lifetime of dodging red eyes doesn't go away overnight, in spite of Hunter. John. Look at him. Hunter has lied, or been mistaken, so much in the last day that I have no reason to trust him. No reason, except the whole of our lives together. If he's wrong, Karen will kill him as well. 
and I don't want to live without my invisible partner, I turned my head slowly, peeking out between my eyelashes. Looking into Charon's eyes is like getting close to an incandescent light bulb. After only a few seconds, I can't tell the eyes from the dancing green ghosts they leave on my vision. The rest of the room seems to dim, and there's a sharp smell like the head of a match. My ears are buzzing, and I'm hot all over. He can't kill you. It's not time. So far away, Hunter's voice, and so sad. I look at Charon, crouched and bristling, staring at me with such sizzling heat its eyes are turning white. If looks could kill, I think, and want to giggle. Outside the walls of this room, the rest of the world is carrying on its business. I can hardly imagine it. This, here, this is the whole world. This is the only thing that matters. That's when I realize, this is the job Hunter and I have to do, to get rid of this hellish partnership that's upsetting the natural order of things. It's why we were put together and why I can talk to him. It may be why I pushed this investigation so hard, though I could probably still blame pride and boredom. We should have spent all our time practicing for this moment, not messing around and bickering. Too late now. The heat washes over me, but it doesn't hurt. It's like putting my hand close to a flame, but not too close. Just as long as I keep Hunter's reassuring voice in my mind, I'm fine. Everything's fine. I hold Charon's baleful stare and smile in the face of the black dog. I've been thinking so much about dogs, I forget people can be dangerous, too. Switch, calls Hutch. Charon's gaze flicks away. I blink and shiver out of that heat, that light. I'm only just ready for Hutch and the knife he's grabbed, the one from the website picture. I shift my body left and catch him as he comes, even as the pain arcs across my side. I realize he knows this is the showdown. He can't explain away a stabbing in his own private office, performed with his own private property. I've never been stabbed before. I want to recoil from the shock and pain and just curl up in a ball, but my body has too much forward momentum, and I grapple Hutch to the floor, twisting his arm back so he's forced to drop the knife. As we roll and wrestle, I try not to notice how much blood there seems to be on our clothes, our hands, the carpet. A second pain cuts through me, and I think Hutch has another weapon, but he's pulled away, grabbing at his own chest. We turn together to where Hunter and Cowan are standing nose to nose. Their eyes are locked on each other's, and there's a hum coming off them that sets my teeth on edge, like a high-voltage cable running through the room. There's no way Hunter can win this, whatever it is. He's pudgy and silly where Karn is a home killing machine. Does it work both ways, while I pop out of existence when he goes? Then Hutch will be free to do as he likes. Nobody else will have any idea how to stop him. I should kill him first, while he's distracted. But either because of the wound or the energy drawn in by the dogs, I can hardly move. I've never really believed in the supernatural, apart from the whole invisible dog thing, of course, but I can feel something in this room, some force bigger than any of us, shifting position, battling for the upper hand. Or maybe it's the blood loss making me lightheaded. Hutch is propped up against the wall, his eyes are closed and his fists are clenched so hard the veins stand out. Is he somehow lending his energy to Charon? Madly, I'm jealous of the connection he has with his dog. Hunter is my pal, my partner, but wait. Hunter is... The closest friend I've ever had. He's seen and heard everything. We have no secrets. I've never trained him the way Hutch has trained Charon, because that's not what friends do. Hunter! My mouth is dry. Hunter, get him. His gaze never shifts from those other eyes, but an ear flicks and the tail gives a tiny wag. I see a shimmer surrounding the two dogs, a white glow. Charon looks smaller now, and that head is just a dog's head, not a monster's. While Hunter, his stupid trench coat has fallen from his shoulders, his flat lab fur is bristling and his ears are cocked. He looks more like a wolf than I've ever imagined he could. I'm helping. I'm assuming that's the right thing to do. Hutch lets his breath out in a hiss, and Charon's chest puffs out as the dog regains his strength. Hutch is helping too. We can't have that. I push myself up on one arm, launch forward through dizzy waves, and punch him in the nose. It's not elegant, but it does the job. It's a punch for Phoebe Knight. Anne and Delphine, and for me and my dog. Hutch gasps, and Charon breaks eye contact. No, no, no! One hand on his nose, Hutch flaps the other at Charon. The big beast reacts as if it's been kicked, bows its head, and shrinks into itself, and keeps shrinking. Hunter towers over the other dog with eyes like looking at the sun through a pinhole. Charon whimpers, rolls over, tries to wriggle away on its back towards Hutch, who is looking at him and at Hunter with astounded fury that changes to horror, then grief. Neither human nor dog is paying any attention to anything except each other. Charon wags feebly, pawing at Hutch's knee. Hutch shifts his hand, wanting to pat, to comfort. It's all wrong. Charon should be easing Hutch's exit from the world, 
not the other way around. I guess that's what happens when you break the rules. I slip a hand into my pocket and touch my phone. Home button, then the bottom left of the screen, where it says emergency. Then three stabs where the nine will be. I've practiced this, though I never thought I'd really use it. As I make my third press, so faintly I hope it registers, the big black dog folds in on itself, flattening to a black burn stain on the carpet. Hutch is running his fingers through the air where Karan was. He's never been able to touch his dog, of course, but there's a vast difference between a space that contains an intangible black dog nobody else can see and a space that only used to contain one. He's not trying to kill me now, which is great. The pain shoots through me and I realize he doesn't need to. The fire in Hunter's eyes isn't white hot anymore. It's faded to a cozy pinkish red, like the bar of an electric fire, and I wonder how I could ever have been scared of that comforting familiar glow. Hunter? I drop to my knees and beckon him over. No wonder he looked sad earlier when he told me it wasn't time. He knew the time was coming, and soon. But that's okay. It hurts a lot, and I want it to be over. I get it now. Your black dog isn't the bringer of death I always feared under Hunter's daft, playful exterior. It's familiar presence, revealed at the end so you'll have company while everything else fades away. And I want a piece of that. Hutch won't hurt anyone else. My work is done, though good luck to whoever has the job of trying to sort out what the hell happened in here. I hope Hunter's next gig is a good one. He's a good boy. Here, Hunter. From the cradle to the grave, Hunter. Till death do us part. Hunter, why won't you look at me? I slide out of the hospital bed and walk over to the window, holding on to the furniture as I go. The doctors tell me I shouldn't be alive. I lost half my blood. My body shut down. Brain, too. But my heart just wouldn't stop beating, even when they turned the machines off. It was a nurse who told me the other thing, how I burst from unconsciousness calling out and looking wildly around. It took three of them to tidy me back into bed and squirt in some drugs. The ache inside me isn't from the wound. It isn't from the needles and tubes and the harsh mixture of medicines. It's the loss. I didn't even see him go, but I knew, knew before I was even conscious. Hunter broke the rules by not helping me to my death, and now he's gone. I can only hope he's been reassigned, some other cute little baby, this one blissfully unaware of his presence. But for all I know, he's the one who ceased to exist, instead of me. For the first few days, I kept expecting a new dog to pop up. A fluffy puppy, the mirror of my fantasy new life for Hunter. But nothing. Seems my black dog privileges have been revoked. There's only one person who can know how this feels. Now we really do have something in common. But I can't, I won't, seek him out. I remember what he said about a strong will. If mine had been stronger, if I'd been a smarter, tougher person, could I have saved Hunter from vanishing out of existence? It's not fair. Hutch and Karn broke the rules for years and got away with it until we came along. All we did was set things right. We didn't deserve to have it go so wrong for us instead. I wonder what will happen at the end. I'm not stupid enough to imagine I'm going to live forever. Now there'll be no hunter to lay his paw just above my hand, the closest he can get to touching, and send me on my way with compassion in his kind, wise eyes and jerky on his breath. My room looks out across a square, with the river in the distance. I watch the people crisscrossing from one street to another, hurried or chilled, on business or just strolling. They're all reasonably decent people, probably. I've removed, I've helped to remove, a threat to the nice people, someone who'd cheat them out of their money and, when it suited them, take their lives. It's what I grew up wanting to do, and I should be pleased, but I can't help feeling that the whole lot of them aren't worth what I've lost. The black dogs trot at their heels like second shadows, poodles and cockers, big Newfoundlands and tiny chihuahuas, anything that comes in black, and plenty of mongrels too. From up here, their eyes are tiny sparks. I flit from one to the next, hoping for the flap of a trench coat or the glint of sun off a pair of shades, but nothing. Following my own wishful thinking, he's beside some newborn's cot. I'll keep looking, Hunter, boy. I'll never stop. All those people, and I'm the only one who knows that none of them is alone, or has to face the end alone. Well, I am, and I must.